Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today we are joined by the wonderful John Hamburg, who is the writer and director of the new Netflix movie, Me Time. And I've heard you talk a little bit in the past about how one of the challenges in, in writing and also directing is finding a project that feels like something that you want to spend potentially the next few years of your life working on and, and incredibly committed to. And so particularly for this film, because it wasn't just writing the script and going through that development process, it was also all of the pre-production, production and post for directing as well. Kind of what was that tipping point from the initial genesis of the idea where you realized that this was a a story that you could really really flesh out into a full feature and secondly something that you wanted and, and were happy to spend that amount of time on so yeah I mean I it, it is a big thing because movies take so long um and you know any series all that stuff take takes quite a bit of time but um and I always do look for some thing that's going to keep me through you know the whole process and I think this movie, it, it sort of reflected a time in my life that I was experiencing. You know, I have, um, well, now she's 10 and a half. I have a 10 and a half year old daughter. And, um, you know, I think I was just thinking about literally the concept of, of time and, and seeing it with friends and family. And you, you don't just have to have kids, although having kids is a very specific um, you know, idea of how you suddenly your time is not your own. And it's all about like, spending the time with your kid and or things you choose to do like if you go off and make a movie or do a project in another city you're away from your family and so all these things were kind of bubbling around my mind um and, and, you know I was like I feel like that's a very relatable premise and I'm always looking for things that are kind of relatable that that maybe people haven't told yet as a story you know whether it's like male friendship or or you know, uh, meeting in-laws, something like that, like that are these very sort of very primal, basic ideas, but that I can put my own spin on. And so it was really just thinking about where I was at, uh, you know, as a, well, at that time, 40 something person with a young kid and, um, and, and thinking about the concept of time and thinking about how people don't really, you, you know, think about it. And, and so many people are sort of like, oh, God, I have no time to myself. It's such a common thing. And then what would you do if you had that time? And most of us, myself included, don't really know what we would do. And you're bringing up that idea of, of relatability, which is always part of a central core of everything that you're writing and or writing and directing. Um, and so when you were shaping, particularly Kevin Hart's character of Sunny for the yeah. film, how did that influence a lot of the details that you wanted to bring into him, but also how you thought about the circumstances that you're going to take him into in, in thinking about what would what would feel like a realistic scenario that this character could potentially end up in, in a very heightened <laughs> heightened space of his life? Yeah. I mean, so the first draft was written without Kevin. It, you know, I just wrote it, at, you know, wrote the script to the best of, of my abilities. And then once Kevin got involved, you know, I shaped it for him specifically. And that came out of conversations he and I had, um, you know, in some certain sequences, like there's a whole sequence where they go to kind of Huck Chella, you know, and he wrestles a mountain lion and uh, things like that. Um, that came from sort of the idea of, Kevin being a fish out of water and like, what would, you know, you sort of imagine Kevin as this grounded family man and what would be like the most foreign to him. And it's not necessarily a foreign country or foreign land. It's like a 40 something guy hanging out with a bunch of uh, 20 somethings in, you know, I picture myself in these scenarios. Like I've never been to Burning Man, but um, I have many friends who go. And to me, I'm like, it just isn't, I probably would have a good time ultimately because I like experiencing things that sort of scare me, but you know, it's like, it's just not where I would necessarily be comfortable. Um, and so I sort of put myself into those scenarios and I try to put Kevin, you know, thinking about specifically Kevin Hart, you know, it, Kevin Hart running from a mountain lion is just, is a very specific thing that may not work for some other actors. Um, but that's the, the beauty of having, you know, somebody attached to the project and then being the writer director, I can go back and really shape it for them. And in the fact that that you are the writer and the director, how did that change some of the details that maybe you were thinking about in terms of the writing process, in terms of maybe there's de details in terms of exposition that you're putting in there that maybe you wouldn't think about because a different director might envision it in a mm. different way, because essentially the script writing process is an extension of the pre-production process as a director for you at that point. 
Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for so long as a writer director that I don't even think about it really. I just, you know, I'm not putting in lots of um, camera angles and things like that into the script, but, you know, because I know I'm directing it, um, there's certain things that I can leave out, but I really just write the script almost the way I, I would write anything. You know, I, I write for myself and then I've also written scripts for other people and, or came on as a script doctor on different movies. And so, um, it doesn't really change that much. I just try to write honestly the best story I can and the most kind of entertaining read that, that I can, because it, I, I know I'll be, you know, looking at the script when I direct, but I also know I'm going to have to attract a studio actors crew, you know, all these people, and they're all going to, you know, respond or not to this document. So I just try to make it as, as entertaining a read as I can and as specific as I can. I think that's a big part of my writing process to try to make, you know, really make him, the characters live in the world and make pop cultural references or, or, um, you know, make the characters just as kind of, yeah, I guess the word as specific as I can. I love that. And in talking a little bit about the opening of the film, you know, that's kind of the build up and the setup as to, who Kevin's character is, but also Mark Wahlberg's character, what that friendship is. And, and we're meeting Kevin's character at a point where he's at a crossroads, you know, he's he's kind of wanting to make a change in his life. So then when we meet him as this incredibly dedicated family man, a few minutes into the film, that feels like a natural trajectory to for him to have gone on. And we kind of understand that journey. Um, and so what were the main the main points that you wanted to make sure to communicate through having that opening scene and everything that you wanted to tell us about these two characters, their relationship, mm. their friendship, and this kind of crossroads where they're both about to go in very different directions in their lives. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that opening scene is crucial because you see it, it's a very common thing in friendships. And I think about this a lot, you know, where people, you just kind of feel yourself drifting apart from people you grew up with or met either in childhood or in college or as a young adult, you know, at, at some point, we all make choices and, and we either align together, it seems, or we just go off in, in different directions. And so I wanted to kind of capture this moment in time where you see that uh, Mark has, you know, Mark's character, Huck, Mark Wahlberg's character, Huck has, has kind of created this insane scenario for his 29th birthday, uh, which isn't a milestone, by the way, but he, he celebrates every birthday as if it is. Um, and you see that Kevin's nervous. And that is just inherent to their dynamic that Kevin's a little more uptight, whereas Mark's more of a, a you know, a, a, a loose cannon. But, you know, they say, you know, Mark references the fact, okay, Kevin, I get it. You're about to get married and, you know, you got to be more responsible. And so I did want to hit upon the fact that he's at this crossroads and, and getting married uh, is one of those benchmarks in life. I think that, you know, whether it's marriage or you're just saying, I'm going to make a commitment to another person, you know, um, it, it, it's a, it's a milestone in, in one's life that that where you're basically choosing to be more responsible. You're you're you know you're going to be living for someone else other than yourself. And so I, I wanted to capture that. And you know you see uh, you see where they were, so then you can see where they're going in the rest of the film. And you're then taking Kevin's character Sonny on this arc where. By the end of the film, he has changed certain things a little bit in his life and, and his personality has shifted a little bit, but he's still very true to who he was at the beginning. You know, that yeah. that apprehension, that that kind of real steadiness that he has, his dedication to his family, none of those aspects go away. He just finds a slightly better version for himself that works a little bit better in the world for him and his family and his friendship. Um, and so how did you set about arcing out and finding mm -hmm. where those little details of growth or change were going to be, but never having him stray too far from where we meet him at the beginning. That's a, that's a great question. Thanks for, I appreciate you picking up on that because um, I guess going back again to relatability, like I don't think most people change completely. And in fact, when people change completely, I worry about them a little bit. Um, so I think one of the ideas with Kevin's character with Sonny is that he he's doing fine. He just needs to kind of get out of his own way and, and get out of his own head. And I think for so many people, like you're, they're doing okay, but there's all these things from either society or childhood or comparing yourselves to others, especially now with social media that, you know, we're looking, oh, their life is better than mine. And really 
if you kind of let go of that stuff, you don't need to change completely. You just kind of need to um, ground yourself. And so that was the, the idea with Kevin's character. He's a great husband. He's a devoted uh, parent to his two kids. He's, you know, he, he's doing things pretty well, um, but he's so insecure that he's like overcompensating so much and he's really unhappy at the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, there were little, you know, things I did in the beginning where you see how overbearing a parent he is and he's got to be head of the PTA and head of the talent show. And he's driving these poor kids crazy in, in library as a library volunteer. But um, I tried to then create, you know, little minor things where you sort of see him, uh, you know, slowly start to, to shed some of that stuff uh, as, you know, and so by the end, he's not a totally different person. He's just maybe a more complete version of himself if that makes sense. It doesn't. And when you create these antagonistic forces that, that come into his world and shake things up a little bit, mostly through yeah. Huck, um, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. you know, you do end up in situations where things have really built up into quite a large heightened environment, but you do it through building a lot of small things. So what happens if he goes to someone's house and he starts by deleting their DVR, <laughs> but now the Uber driver's there smashing plates and now they've accidentally <laughs> hit a beloved pet with the car. Yeah. Um, and so how do you kind of create that, that kind of like insular structure of what's, what are the, what are the forces that we want to come and shake up as well, but by doing so with each small action gradually leading to the bigger situations? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it's kind of my view of the characters I write that they're not doing huge, terrible things. They're doing sort of things that are within themselves. So they go to, yeah, they, they want to get back at this Armando character because they think he's making a play at, at Kevin's wife. And you think, you know, it's sort of like set up an expectation. You know, you think that, that they're going to mess with his house and, and vandalize it and do all these things. And they do the most minor things. They're rear, they're, they're throwing out his spices. Um, but, you know, then as a, as a comedy writer, you know, I just try to build and build and build, but in ways that are believable um, and, and surprising. That's my, we don't always get there, but that's the, the goal I'm trying to do. So it's like his intention, I fully believe that Kevin's character would do small things. He's just a normal suburban dad. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to start shattering windows and setting the place on fire. But, um, you know, I think then it's just, it spirals and suddenly it's like, he's an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances, which is like such a cliche of storytelling through the years, but that's kind of how I think of it. And in this case, an extraordinary, you know, not to give too much away, but yeah, they, they, uh, you know, they run over a tortoise and it's like, again, I put myself in those shoes. Like, what if I just went to do a minor little thing and through a, t you know, through backing up in an Uber, I, I, you know, maybe create a crime, you know, it could be, you know, or do something really, really, uh, bad. Um, so it's just about building and building and building. And with elements that are surprising, but believable within the story, I wanted to ask about the genesis of, of Seal's appearance, because again, you get to use that as a moment where we then get to see Kevin performing musically and his character was pursuing a career in the music industry before he got married and had kids. Yes. So that gets to kind of explore another facet and another side that we've only heard about at that point. Um, but what was the genesis specifically of it being Seal coming to make a cameo performance at a house party that ends up being at his place? Um, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, that is a surprise. So if you, if, you know, if it is a spoiler, so we, you know, for, if people haven't seen the movie, uh, we want to make sure that's a, that's denoted as a spoiler. Um, but, uh, you know, so when I rewrote the, the movie for Kevin, um, or with, you know, once Kevin got attached to play Sonny, um, that's when I came up with the, his alter ego being Dr. Silk, this kind of, uh, you know, he was, he's a singer songwriter in the adult contemporary space. And so, you know, so that, that started with the Kevin, you know, with Kevin and, and kind of talking with him. And I remember pitching him that idea. And I think he, you know, he liked it. The, uh, this, I don't know where the name Dr. Silk came, came to me from, but seemed appropriate. And then it's like, okay, who would his idols be, you know, growing up? Um, and, you know, you, we ran through a lot of different names of, of people. Um, but Suddenly, you know, the idea of Seal, I, I am a big Seal fan, you know, especially, you know, when that first album came out, you know, I was like, played it on repeat nonstop and uh, 
then you go, well, he's a, he's a gifted musician, he, you know, song, singer, songwriter. He has um, one of the great voices ever. And Seals also, first of all, by the fact that he has one name and also that he's, you know, very tall and distinct uh, looking like he's iconic. So it's like, who would be, who would just make your eyes pop out of your skull when they walk into your backyard, especially if they were, I would believe that Seal would be one of uh, Sonny's musical heroes. So all of those things, it was like, oh, we have to get Seal. There's nobody else. You know, I'm, I'm going to rewrite this storyline if we can't get Seal. And of course, you never know if you're going to get them. You know, I, I, in my movie, I Love You, Man, you know, the band Rush was a very big part of that story. And, and I was like, I don't, if I can't get Rush, I don't know what to do. And fortunately, uh, they agreed to do it. But, you know, so it's a, it's a similar kind of idea. But um, that's that's where that sort of series of events is what led to seal. And thankfully he, he said yes. And uh, you know, his days filming, maybe it was a couple of days where just some of the most fun I've ever had as a filmmaker, because he's so great. And he, you know, was so generous with the, with the crowd and, and the background actors and in the scene where he performs with Kevin. And it was, it was one of those days you just pinch yourself and go, I can't believe this is my job. And with that point, in writing the scripts that you were bringing up where you were doing a part of the script, now knowing that you had Kevin, now knowing yeah. that you had Mark, yeah. what do you, you know, you, you were mentioning earlier how the idea of Kevin running from a mountain lion is inherently funny and, and very specific to him in a certain way, stylistically in, the, in a comedy. What were some of the other details that really came into the foreground in these characters or, or in moments in the story that were mm. part of that particular draft process once they were cast? Yeah. Um, God, there, I mean, with Kevin, who came in before Mark, there, there's so much. I mean, like I said, the entire the entire sequence of of Huck Chella, um, you know, of going to this Huck Chella and the poor, you know, being told he's got to use the bathroom with with a bucket, um, you know, this luggable loo uh, that came from my producing partner, Lauren. She was on a camping trip and and she went to a camping store before I was like they have these things called luggable loose I was like okay well that's going in the script um but uh so that whole sequence you know again came about from these discussions with Kevin and then you know with Mark um he you know the character as is he was pretty comfortable with 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 Huck as is but I definitely leaned into I would say kind of the sweetness and vulnerability of Huck um because I think Mark can play that so well. You know, sometimes we think of Mark Wahlberg as this action star and he is, you know, and and kind of uh, very tough, but he's got such a sweetness and a vulnerability. And I really wanted to tap into that. And ultimately, you know, his character is just kind of lonely and, and an over, you know, he's never quite, he, he, he it does regret the fact that maybe, he had, doesn't have a family of his own and, you know, that, that his friends have moved on. So he's forced to, to hang out with people, you know, 20, 30 years younger than him. But um, so a lot, you know, I was just making sure that those touchstones uh, would be in the script because I think Mark plays those so well. And also talking about the supporting characters yeah. um, a little bit as well, because there's there's kind of different structural ways that these supporting characters are driving the story forward alongside the two of them. You know, there's there's a different dynamic to what we get character wise from other parents at the school and kind yeah. of how they operate in a group and what that tells us about Kevin's character, um, you know, to the fact that the Uber driver becomes someone who isn't just driving a car, but becomes a very active participant alongside the two of them. And so how do you set up about figuring out not only how do I want to flesh out the supporting character, but what is their narrative force mm. within the story going to be? Yeah, I mean, one thing I definitely aim to do as a filmmaker is, is have these supporting characters be basically as important as the main characters. Like they have lives, they're three-dimensional people, and I invest a lot of time and energy into making them as strong as I can. And then of course you have to cast them, you know, and I've been so fortunate, like on this movie, you know, with these amazing actors playing these supporting characters. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, like with Alan, the, this kind of dad friend, you know, that, that um, he, he's kind of the, the devil on, on Sonny's shoulder, you know, sort of pushing him. He, he's, and, and, and the idea that he puts on this front and, it's like, I, I, as I was saying, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, like, I think I look at other parents at my child's school and go, oh, that, 
that person's got it all. Their life is perfect. And, you know, you don't really know what's going on. So I was like, imagine that person that you kind of look up to and think they've got, they've got a better minivan than I do. Um, and suddenly you find out, you know, towards the end, this man is a complete shell of a human. You know, he, he feels like he has no, uh, no recourse in his own life. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the idea of that character of like the, the, the dark side of a, of a parent friend. Um, and then, you know, with Thelma, the Uber driver, who's, you know, we uh, had this relatively new to the scene uh, actress, Ilya, who's incredible. I mean, Yale trained, um, just amazing. She's going to have an amazing career, I, I, I think. Um, you know, she, it was like, we get in these cars and I just, again, was thinking about my own life. Like we, we you know, Uber, Lyft, whatever it is, like rideshare is such a big part of modern life. And we're having these kind of this intimate moment with a total stranger, you know, day in and day out, and they have an entire life and a point of view. And so I was just kind of writing about what if somebody, you know, you get in a car and somebody just has a really strong point of view, wants to get involved. You know, she's, she's from the minute they're in the car, she's chiming in and sort of like a Greek chorus and pushing these guys. And, um, you know, it just felt like, both relatable, but, you know, pushed to the extreme and also that it could just be a source of great comedy. And, and also again, with Kevin, you know, to your point, you're asking about like, what do, how do I write for Kevin? I try to have all these forces of opposition. So it's not just Mark's character. Suddenly he meets an Uber driver and she's going to give him a hard time. And she, it helps that she towers over him physically. Um, but, you know, just she, She's, you know, he has no chance up against her. And I think that's a great source of, of Kevin's comedy. That's one of his gifts to come up against forces of opposition. And, and then when it comes to comedy as a whole, obviously timing and pacing and rhythm is such a crucial element of how you're building that out. And, you know, holding on something for a beat longer can completely change the trajectory yeah. or the delivery of something. And so when you're shot listing filming scenes and going through the the post-production schedule what were some of the the specific nuances of, of figuring out a specific rhythm or specific beats that you know individual scenes needed because it's not mm. a case of the same intonation throughout the entire film it's it's different structural pacings throughout yeah yeah I mean it, it's it's for, through every step you know during production my goal is to film as much as possible and you know, I didn't have a total, extremely long schedule, but, you know, I had enough time to really explore and experiment and use improvisation with these amazing actors. And, you know, one of my editors uh, on my previous movies called it, I think it was like, you know, storing away nuts for the winter, you know, as if you're, you're an animal, you know, who's got to hibernate. When, then when you get into the editing room, you have all these nuggets, you know, that you can work from. So I try to, so during production, I try to just film as much as I can get as much variation. Let's try it this way, that way, and then really, really discover it in the editing process. And, you know, our first cut of this movie was very, very long. Um, you know, it had the kitchen sink and sadly we had to lose some things that I think worked quite well, you know, in great moments with actors, but, you know, just to, to grind it down to really like, what's the story, um, and then you're crafting comedy and it, it, it's an art and a science. And we're trying to figure out, you know, there's, there's a moment where uh, Kevin, where Regina Hall and, and her family, you know, Kevin's family leave town and Kevin's alone. And he, uh, he puts on, you know, an adult movie because he's going to have some, some private time. And then his wife and child walk in um, on him. So uh, again, which is a big spoiler in the movie, but um, it, you know, it, it, to figure out that moment, it was, um, it didn't work at first. And, you know, you know, you, you can tell because we preview these movies and we figure out, you know, where all the laughs are and everything for the most part. And um, we were just scratching our heads like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this, isn't this working? And then one moment we just realized we structurally kind of had it wrong. And, and you know, it was like a eureka moment. And then we recut it and suddenly it became when we previewed like one of the biggest explosive laughs in the movie. Uh, again, I don't know what it's like for everybody watching at home on Netflix, but we, we preview these movies in movie theaters. So, um, you know, it was, it's, it's really interesting. You know, you, took, you just craft it and you have to be open to failure, you know, which we do, you know, 
all the time and then try to figure out, okay, this isn't working. Why? And it's kind of like, it's left brain, right brain. It's a whole process. Well, it's been so interesting to hear all of these details about how you structured everything out throughout your process and really appreciate you sharing all of this and congratulations on everything with the film. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much.